Hi there, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome back to our Nexus and GP webinar series. Uh, sorry we've had to take a hiatus because we were waiting for uh, SMC to give us uh, approval to be accredited as a CME provider. So we are and therefore we are relaunching our uh, Nexus and GP webinar series. Uh, so we'll be doing a fortnightly talk every Wednesday at one o'clock. Um, you can find us on our website or on our Facebook page uh, with the schedule of the upcoming talks. So we have talks all listed all the way till March. So uh, following uh, three months, we'll have six talks going. So I hope you can uh, join us uh, in our Nexus and GP webinar series. So uh, for a bit of uh, house rules, uh, don't worry about submitting your MCR numbers. We have that already recorded when you registered to the talk and uh, we will be uh, submitting your uh, MCR numbers for CME points and uh, we have also applied to the College of Family Physicians uh, for FM core points for these talks and uh, once we get approval we'll be submitting it uh, for the core points as well. So for the rest of the talk I will continue with the talk and if you have any questions with regards to the talk please uh, submit through the Q&A button. Uh, my manager Lee Ka will be collating the questions. Um, those who wish to ask your questions live in person, uh, please do so indicate and uh, Lika will get back to you. Uh, once at the Q&A session starts, we will activate, uh, we will uh, give you permission to, to activate uh, your camera and mic so that you can uh, ask uh, questions directly to me. If not, then we will just reply through your Q&A questions that you submitted through the Q&A button. There will also be two polls coming out through the talk, so uh, for everybody to get involved. Uh, so once we launch the polls later on, I uh, hope that you can uh, participate and uh, give your opinion. So uh, let me get started. So today we'll be talking about vascular leg ulcers and wound care. And uh, this is <coughs> my group, Nexus Surgical. We are your trusted surgeons. Uh, there's five of us in our group. Myself, I do vascular surgery and general surgery. All of us are general surgeons. Uh, Jane Tan is colorectal. Dr. Lim Kong, he does upper GI and bariatric. Ho, Ho Chun Kit does uh, HPB. And uh, Dr. Tan Yaswan does breast surgery. So hopefully we'll be able to deal with uh, any surgical issues that you or your patients have. So in terms of <clears throat> talking about vascular ulcers in the legs, I think key ones will be varicose veins. So venous ulcers are usual ulcers that we see. So I'll just spend a little bit more time talking to you about varicose veins. In terms of anatomy, as we all know, there's a, the deep vein, the femoral vein, as well as the superficial vein system, the long saphenous vein, as well as the short saphenous vein in the uh, posterior calf. And in the normal vein, upwards flow, valves prevent downward flow. And in patients who have varicose veins, the uh, damaged valves causes backflow of blood into the, the superficial vein. And that increases the pressure deep, uh, lower down in the leg and distension of all the distal veins. And this is what usually we see in a vascular surgery practice, patients presenting with spider veins. So these are the purplish intradermal veins. These are more superficial, close to the surface of the skin, so they appear purplish. <clears throat> Reticular veins are the larger diameter veins that are deeper, so they present as greenish rather than purplish veins. And these are all usually a slightly bigger diameter. And of course, the one we commonly see patients with big distended uh, varicose veins. And the problem is the persistent high pressure leads to deposition of pigment around the ankle, causing hyperpigmentation. This reduces skin nutrition and causes permanent uh, skin changes, uh, as you can see on this picture. And unfortunately, this unhealthy skin is prone to ulceration and poor healing. So what we do in the clinic when we get a patient with suspected varicose veins, <coughs> we do a bedside uh, duplex ultrasound, assess the deep and superficial veins, and basically what we are looking for is actually detection of reversal of flow in the veins in the patient in a standing position. <clears throat> and how we treat varicose veins? 
And we all know the uh, standard treatment, uh, historical treatment is high ligation and stripping of the long saphenous vein. And uh, that's the gold standard. Nowadays, we are doing more and more uh, endovenous laser therapy or radiofrequency ablation of the long saphenous vein. These are the new uh, minimally invasive uh, te techniques to deal with uh, the long saphenous vein. Medical treatments also, uh, Deflon, graduated compression stockings. These are the mainstay of uh, medical treatment options. <clears throat> so with high ligation and stripping of the long saphenous vein, this is a very traditional approach, requires a patient to be under a general or a regional anesthetic. Make two incisions, one in the groin up here, one in the knee. Cannulate the long saphenous vein and strip the long saphenous vein out. Endovenous laser therapy, now uh, one of the minimally invasive uh, techniques. Basically, we make an injection in the long saphenous vein at the knee, pass the laser fiber up from the knee up to the SFG. And the laser, once it energizes, actually creates heat. And this heat causes uh, vein intima inflammation and eventual sclerosis over after a period of six to eight weeks. Radiofrequency ablation of the LSV, again, similar technique, but instead of using laser, we use radiofrequency. And this basically creates heat up to 120 degrees. Same thing, we want to cause internal injury to the vein, leading eventually to sclerosis. So this is a puncture at the level of the knee with a catheter. The catheter goes up in the long saphenous vein itself, all the way up until it reaches the saphenofemoral junction. Energize the radiofrequency catheter and this creates heat at the tip and this causes uh, internal injury to the vein. And the post-op care, the patient can walk immediately after the procedure. Normally, I keep the patient on crepe bandages for two days. We change it to a tuber grip and the patient wears the tuber grip for two weeks. And basically, no strenuous exercises for the first two weeks, but thereafter, they are basically back to their normal uh, activities of daily living. And it avoids a general anesthesia. We usually just do this under a moderate sedation. There are no big incisions in the groin and in the thigh much less infection and bruising risks, faster recovery and return to normal activities. And the important thing is the long-term recurrence rate is actually very similar to traditional surgery, which is approximately 3 to 5%. The disadvantage is the cost of the additional consumables, the radiofrequency catheter, the machine, as well as risk of skin burn, because again, we're using heat to create the intimal injury, but the risk of that is less than 3%. The heat also can cause saphenous nerve injury, but this usually is again less than 5%. And usually what the patients will complain of is they may get a little bit of numbness of the skin around the inner part of the knee, and usually that's about it. What they will feel is that they will feel a cord-like inflamed LSV, so there'll be this heart thickening under the skin in the medial thigh for about four to six weeks. So these are the results that we don't promise the patient because you have to be in Korea to get this kind of results. In terms of medication, so uh, common mainstay for treating varicose vein patients, uh, varicose vein problems is actually Daflon, micronized purified flavonoid fraction. And basically it acts as a venotonic, increases the venous tone and reduces capillary permeability. So this prevents the uh, buildup of pressure in the veins and the leakage of the uh, plasma. <clears throat> Another uh, mainstay of treatment, medical treatment is graduated compression stockings. So as you can see from this picture, why graduated? Because the pressure applied by the stocking is highest at the ankle and decreases as it goes up the knee. And basically, it applies compression on the muscle belly, and the compression actually produces the venous reflux. And usually, this is a graded compression, so there are different uh, levels of how tight the compression stockings are. Normally, we go with a grade 1 or a class 1 to start off with and move up to a class 2. All right. And this is different from the TED stockings or the anti-embolic stockings. Well, TED stockings and anti-embolic stockings, the amount of pressure that it that it imparts is actually much less than a class 1 compression stocking. So the pressure that the TED stocking applies is actually not enough to prevent venous reflux.
Occasionally, we see patients who have spider veins, and our mainstay of treatment in the clinic usually is injection sclerotherapy. So a couple of agents that we use, most commonly used is uh, sodium tetradecal sulfate or what we call fibrovene. Again, same thing. Basically, what we want is to cause a chemical irritation on the vein intima. So eventually, the, sclerosin, the inflammation will then cause sclerosis of the vein. But generally, it's difficult to do, especially if the spider veins are smaller than uh, 0.5 mm because it's too fine for even the insulin needle to get in. So for those that are very fine, the other options are laser sclerotherapy. So we use a laser, vein, laser beam that is directed onto the skin and the laser energy is absorbed by the red blood cells in the vein. The energy that's absorbed then creates heat and the heat causes thermal injury damaging the vein. So as you can see here, the laser is being applied through the probe onto the skin and it's causing the vein to close off. The problem with laser sclerotherapy is the laser energy is actually absorbed by melanin, which is your normal uh, skin pigment. So the patients can develop post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. The risk of uh, PIH is dependent on both the characteristic of the laser that's being used, as well as the patient's skin color. So darker skin patients, because they have more melanin, tend to absorb much more of the laser energy. So for darker, so we go by Fitzpatrick grading of the skin, uh, melanin. Generally for our patients, usually they are about a Fitzpatrick through the three, sometimes four. So the higher the Fitzpatrick grade you go, the higher your risk of uh, PIH. <clears throat> now, one other technique that I use is uh, this machine called Vingo. Basically, it is a needle probe that actually delivers microbursts of energy. And this causes local thermal injury to the vein. Again, same thing, thermal injury causes inflammation. Inflammation eventually causes sclerosis. And so this is what happens. It's a very fine needle tip that is applied on the skin. And as the energy is fired onto the skin, you can see that the vein actually closes off. Okay, so moving on to the problem of vascular leg ulcers. So as we all know, ulcer basically is a wound on open sore that doesn't heal or keeps recurring. So the key point in treating ulcers is to understand the underlying etiology. You need to understand what causes the ulcer in order to be able to treat it properly. And so when we're talking about vascular ulcers, like I said, most commonly we will see our patients who have venous ulcers. <clears throat> the next main group will be patients who have arterial ulcers. Patients can also sometimes have both, a mixed arterial and venous ulcer. Neuropathic ulcers are getting more common, especially in, with the high prevalence of diabetes in the elderly population. Others like vasculitis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis can cause ulcers, but we won't be covering that. So, most commonly, we see our patients who have venous ulcers. Now, these are the most common cause of lower limb ulcers. Don't forget that this is also associated with concomitant arterial disease in about 10 to 15% of patients. So, and that affects the treatment of how you treat these venous ulcers. The usual textbook characteristics of venous ulcers, usually medial side of the calf, above the medial malleolus, or what we call the gator area. It just tends to be irregular and the important uh, defining characteristic is actually the presence of reddish <coughs> reddish inflamed granulation tissue and this is quite characteristic of a patient who has a venous ulcer if it's infected occasionally it can become sloughy but generally it's a very shallow ulcer and what happens is basically the problem of venous hypertension so if you look at the capillary bed arterial blood flow comes in through the arterial and is drain through the venule. And there's a balance between the two pressures on the either side of the capillary bed. What happens in patients who have venous hypertension is the blood pressure on the venous end increases, preventing the movement of fluid back into the venule. So what happens is there is continued deposition or, or migration of fluid into the tissue without the uh, fluid going back out. So this leads to increased venous pressure, 
there's definitely much reduced fluid reabsorption leading to edema and also extravasation of RBCs into the interstitial fluid leading to hemosiderin deposition, which is what we see in patients with lipodermatosclerosis. The most important thing is there's impaired nutrient delivery. So this, uh, this tissue area is actually very prone to is keep, uh, sorry, very prone to poor nutrition and poor healing. So this is the CEAP classification. So the clinical classification, as you can see, once they reach C4, 5, and 6, usually they get permanent skin changes, no matter what you treat the venous hypertension with. So patients who have a venous ulcer, the principal treatment, again, firstly, is to exclude arterial disease, treat the infection if present, reduce the venous pressure so that this improves the nutrient delivery, and once that heals, then the key is maintenance therapy to prevent recurrence of ulceration. So I have a very simple uh, algorithm. In somebody who has a venous ulcer, first thing is to exclude arterial disease. And if you have excluded arterial disease, then to assess whether there's any ongoing infection, whether there's slough, pus, or cellulitis. If there is, what we do is we use simple dressings, and sometimes you may use adjuncts like silver or iodine to treat the uh, local infection. And we review the patient weekly. Once the infection has settled, there's no longer any ongoing infection. Then we put the patient on a compression bandaging regime. Basically, the compression bandage is again to reduce the venous pressure in the legs. So we launch our first pull. And... So basically for this, what I'd like to know is what is your preference for assessing arterial circulation in the lower limbs? Okay, so I see quite a lot of uh, participants go with a clinical palpation of foot pulses. That's good. Okay, we'll, we'll take another few seconds to see if there's any more response. All right. So as you can see, a lot of people actually go with the clinical palpation of foot pulses, which is generally what I would do, especially in a, in a primary care setting. Like I said, usually if I can feel a patient's dorsalis pedis and a posterior tibial pulse, Generally, I'm not so worried about whether there's any arterial insufficiency. So that's good. Uh, difficulty with doing an ankle breaker uh, pressure index, as you know, in patients who have uh, diabetes, for example, if they have very severe calcification, the ABI can actually be falsely elevated. So you have to be careful when doing uh, ABI. So in terms of reducing venous pressure, so what we do is uh, compression bandaging, that's to compress the uh, area with the ulcer and we bandage all the way from the foot up to the knee. And if the patient has long saphenous vein reflux, then generally we'll consider doing an intervention and usually now with the minimally invasive interventions, we can do the endovenous laser or the radiofrequency ablation to treat the long saphenous vein. For compression bandaging, the standard is uh, Charing Cross four-layer compression bandaging. So four layers, wool, crepe, elastic bandage, and uh, cohesive bandage. And basically what we want to apply is a pressure around 30 to 40 mmHg around the ankle. And uh, generally I find it quite finicky and that's why I usually leave this to the wound nurses to do because obviously you need to be trained to do this properly. Uh, otherwise, you know, the patient, you want to bandage for one week, you bandage up the patient and then three days later, all the bandages are at the ankle, which is quite common when I do it. So that's why I usually get the wound nurses to do this. But now there's also other methods. Uh, there's a uh, Coban tube. Basically, they modified the standard four layer into just two layers. So it makes it easier to apply. And then we move on to arterial ulcers. This is the second common group of uh, condition usually due to scler atherosclerosis, as we know, and usually all the usual suspects for high-risk factors. I think we see less and less of smoking in our local population, but we get a lot of patients who do have diabetes, so that's, that's where the increasing numbers of arterial disease will probably be coming from. <clears throat> 
And the location is a little bit different compared to Venus. Heel, toes, metatarsal heads. And importantly, web spaces, uh, sometimes you miss out, especially if you don't examine the foot and examine exactly into the web spaces. Punched out deep ulcers usually. And important thing is usually the base is yellow to brown. And you get very minimal bleeding or granulation tissue, which is typical of an ischemic ulcer. So the usual we see is when they have a black necrotic ash scar like this, or a dry uh, ash scar like this. So in the diagnosis, we look for risk factors, as we said earlier, and locally look out for patients who have diabetes. Any previous interventions like angioplasty, presence of claudication and rest pain, and examining the pedal pulses. Now, claudication and rest pain is uh, a bit different from the usual textbook definitions that we get. Uh, let's just go through quickly. Investigations, ABI, but like I said, again, falsely elevated ABI in diabetics, so you need to be careful. More accurate is the toe pressure index, where they measure the pressure in the big toe, but this one requires very specialized uh, equipment. And the diagnostic test, usually we do an ultrasound, a duplex scan, and we look for presence of stenosis on the duplex scan. And the problem with diabetes, especially in our local population, high prevalence of diabetes associated with distal calf and foot vessel disease. That means the stenosis is not in the typical iliofemoral segments. They usually have calf vessel disease and they have damage to the microcirculation, so small vessel disease. And usually it's a late presentation due to peripheral neuropathy. Because usually if they have a calf vessel stenosis, they have foot pain. But because they have neuropathy, they don't feel the feet, their feet. So then that, that's why they usually present quite late. So the key thing is revascularization. Revascularization saves limbs. And the gold standard is again a bypass graft. Okay, Bypassing the stenotic segment uh, requires open surgery. And the problem is whether the patient is suitable, whether the patient is fit for surgery especially cardiovascular fitness. So one cutoff I use is if the LVEF is less than 40%, then I most of the time the patient isn't fit for a bypass surgery. Again, suitable anatomy and the availability of a conduit. Obviously, the best is to use a long saphenous vein. If not, then we can use a prosthetic. And for patients who are not suitable for bypass, we go on to then do peripheral angioplasty. which I'm sure everybody is familiar, get the wire through the stenosis, get a balloon, and basically open up the area of stenosis. <coughs> and in our local population, we tend to do a lot of infrapopletial angioplasty. That means angioplasty of the calf vessels because that's where usually the diabetic patients have a lot of stenosis. And basically, we want to restore the circulation to allow the ulcer to heal. Usually they don't stay open for very long, so even after the angioplasty, they may remain patent for only about three to six months. But that is important because that's the window period that we need for the improved blood circulation to allow the ulcer to heal. Once it's healed, the foot actually can survive on collaterals. So this is an example of the patient that I've angioplastied before. And you notice that this is the ankle. This is the talus, this is the ankle joint. And basically, we managed to get a balloon all the way down the dorsalis pedis to open up a stenosis here. Then moving on to patients with mixed arterial venous ulcers, like I said, generally they appear like a venous ulcer, but they may have some features of ischemia. Important to remember in patients with venous ulcers, 10 to 15% can have some arterial problems. So the important uh, principle of treatment is actually to treat the underlying arterial disease first. Generally, we would not recommend putting in a compression bandage because they are already borderline ischemic. So once you compress them, the, you might convert them into a full ischemia. Our neuropathic ulcers can see uh, does affect our diabetic population who have diabetic peripheral neuropathy. There's usual uh, description of glove and stocking distribution of uh, neuropathy. So the characteristics of the neuropathic ulcer is that they are usually in the pressure areas, malleolus, base of the first metatarsal, plantar aspect of the feet. 
it tends to be a very punched out ulcer. And the base, again, depends on the vascularity. So this is a typical uh, ne neuropathic ulcer. And if you can see the foot deformity, actually this patient actually has a Charcot's foot. So it's a really neuropathic foot with a bony deformity. <clears throat> so the principle of treatment, if you have a patient with a neuropathic ulcer, actually is pressure offloading. The wound treatment it depends on the wound characteristic, whether it's sloughy, whether it's granulating, whether there's infection. But the key is to let the neuropathic ulcer heal is for pressure offloading, to offload the pressure on the ulcer. <clears throat> so my take-home message for dealing with ulcers, firstly is make sure you exclude the arterial disease, because if you have arterial disease, the key is to revascularize. If there's no arterial disease, then it's more likely a venous ulcer. If there's active infection, you need to treat with local dressings. KIV systemic antibiotics, and sometimes we use other adjunct treatments to treat the local infection. Once the venous ulcer has no more active infection, then the treatment is to put on a four-layer compression bandage, treat them until their ulcer is healed, and also treat the underlying reflux. So if it's long saphenous vein reflux, we then add on a treatment to ablate the long saphenous vein. Then the maintenance treatment for a healed venous ulcer is to put the patient on compression stockings to prevent a recurrence of the ulcer. So moving to, on to the topic of wound care, because I'm sure there's a bit of confusion, especially there's so many new wound products coming out on the market uh, every few months. So we have just go back to the basics of wound care. There are basically three stages of wound healing. One is the defensive stage, with, which is the acute inflammation stage. Then there's the proliferation stage, where we look for a presence of granulation, because obviously granulation means that the wound is on the way to heal. Granulation, epitalization, and contraction are the three stages. Then once it's epitalized, the wound will continue to mature, and that's when scar remodeling happens. So basically, we want to concentrate more on the active in, uh, defensive stage of acute inflammation and how we convert that into a healing stage or the proliferation stage. So granulation, this is what we're looking for. Once we see healthy granulation like this, then we know that the wound is on the way to recovery. So this is what we want to aim for in terms of wound care. Eventually, once granulation happens, so this is now epitalization, skin epithelium is growing from the edges of the ulcer inwards, and eventually it will cover up the whole defect. So the principle of topical wound care is basically, firstly, you need to remove the necrotic tissue or foreign bodies, eliminate infection, and absorb the exudate. But however much you absorb the exudate, you must make sure you maintain a little bit of the moist environment or the fluid in the wound to maintain a moist environment because without the moist environment, it's very hard for the wound to heal. Thereafter, is to protect from further trauma and bacterial invasion. So if you look at the range of dressing products that are available, I generally tend to categorize them into to their basic categories. Then that's easier for us to understand what, uh, what product to use for which wound. So starting off with hydrogel. So basically, this is a water-based gel. It prevents wound desiccation. Okay. Again, this has no absorptive capacity. So if the wound has a lot of exudate, then you add the hydrogel, it just becomes very wet. The important thing, it has a mild debriding action. So basically, it can debride the slough in the wound over time. So things like intracite gel, duodenum gel, all this can help to uh, debride some of the slough off the base of the wound. Then moving to the next group is hydrocolloids. Basically, this is a cellulose compound. So this basically absorbs the exudate. So it absorbs some of the exudate and creates a gel-like layer in between. Okay, It does create a little bit of a chemical debridement and it creates an impermeable barrier to water and bacteria. So it's good because it can protect the wound. The important thing is most of all these uh, dressing products is basically non-adherent to the wound bed, which you don't want to have that product stuck on the wound because when you take it off then it can be quite painful for the patient. So it tends to be able to deal with light to medium exudate, for example duodenum. Okay. Transparent films, this is what we commonly use, tegadum film oxide. Basically it's just a 
uh, barrier to water and bacteria. Important to remember, this is still permeable to moisture and oxygen, so it actually allows the wound to breathe through the transparent film. Again, no absorptive capacity, so it doesn't absorb any exudate that comes out from the wound. But we can use it to maintain the moist wound environment and prevent desiccation, especially, like I said, uh, when the wound is actually granulating quite nicely, we can use this. Another group is alginates, seaweed-based dressing. Now, it's made into soft fibers. When these fibers become wet, it actually changes into a gel. The good thing is this alginate can actually absorb quite a lot of exudate, up to 20 times its own weight in exudate. So it's good for moderate to heavily exudative wounds like Keltostat. <clears throat> and then further on is hydrofiber, again a cellulase based product. But this is able to absorb a lot more of the exudate. Again, once these fibers absorb the exudate, it actually converts into a gel layer. So like this, so this is the fiber. Once it absorbs water, it actually becomes into a gel. And lastly, if you have a patient with a lot of exudate, then foam is your answer. It's a hydrophilic polyurethane foam. Hydrophilic means it actually actively absorbs the water from the wound. And it's uh, good for heavily exudating wounds. So we use things like alevin and Mepilex. Then there are, of course, the wound care adjuncts. What else can we use on top of these products? A lot of these products actually have a silver-based component. So basically, ionic silver binds to bacterial cell wall membrane and breaks down the bacterial cell wall. So it's actually a local antibacterial agent. So it's used to reduce the microbial burden in wounds. So it depends on what type of dressing product you want. Foams have silver-based foams, so you have Mepilex Silver. Aquacell Hydrofiber has a silver component as well. And even the polyethylene mesh also has a silver component. So things like Mepilex Silver, Aquacell Silver, or Acticoat. <clears throat> now you see that the dressing actually product looks a bit grayish, blackish. And I always warn the patients when I put silver dressings is your wound will actually look blackish when you remove the dressing so that they don't get worried why the wound has turned black. It's quite common, but once you uh, clean the wound, all this actually will go off. The other one is iodine. So iodosorb comes in either a powder form or in a paste form. And basically this is iodine bound to starch beads. In contact with fluids, the beads take up the water and releases iodine. So the iodine is the one that creates the antiseptic layer in the wound. <coughs> All right, so in general, that's how I break down the whole gamut of uh, wound products that are available into these uh, separate categories. And a key thing is whether or not you have a lot of exudate, mild, moderate, or severe exudate, All right, and which product you apply. So moving on to the common types of wounds and the treatment. So the common types of wounds, you see things like necrotic ash car, sloughy wounds, infected wounds, granulating wounds, exudative wounds, and cavity wounds. So this basically cover most of the clinical spectrum of vascular ulcers that you see. For example, a necrotic ash car. So obviously, this is a patient who has got a heel ulcer, which is ischemic. Right? That's why there's a necrotic ashka here. Well, this one a little bit better because there's an area of granulation so that it's not completely ischemic. Again, when you see a patient with a necrotic ashka, the important thing is to ensure that there's adequate vascularity. So presence of foot pulses, popliteal pulse, femoral pulse. Does the patient have peripheral arterial disease? Because if the patient has, then you need to revascularize because if you don't unfortunately it's going to be very difficult for that wound to heal a lot of times with the necrotic ashka we're tempted to do surgical debridement but don't forget every time you do a surgical debridement the wound right that you debride in the initial first three to five days you will develop a zone of relative ischemia around the edge of the wound so the wound will actually get bigger okay um, so in general, if it's not too bad, I generally try not to do surgical debridement 
I generally try to use chemical debridement, especially if there's no severe local infection, use the chemical debridement and hydration to try and get under the ash guard and it will eventually lift off. Usually takes about two to three weeks. So you don't expect to see immediate results. But if you persist after two to three weeks, usually you will start to see that necrotic ash guard, that black part will slowly lift off and come off. And if there's enough vascularity, underneath the ash guard, you will start to see granulation tissue growing. The problem with surgical debridement is once you expose bone tendon sheaths and vessels, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Now, the other group we see a lot of is patients who have this type of sloughy wounds. There's a lot of yellow slough all across the wound. So we'll go on our second poll. I will launch that. So if you see a patient with this type of stuffy wounds, what kind of dressing products would you choose? That's a lot of people are tending to use Caltostat, but it looks like hydrocolloid gel and foam dressings is uh, slowly catching up. This is like uh, looking at the presidential race in the US, except there's a third candidate now. Okay. All right, we'll give two seconds and then we'll end the poll. And it's neck to neck between uh, alginate dressings and hydrocolloid gel. So I think that's a quite a good response. And uh, let's see. So again, for this type of wounds, again, ensure adequate vascularity important because why do they develop stuff? It's usually there's some degree of ischemia. The slough is usually due to infection, so you need to treat the underlying infection. Now, to treat the underlying infection, you may even have to consider systemic antibiotics. Again, surgical debridement is one option, but again, it's not an option that I would generally do upfront if I can avoid it. I would consider chemical debridement. Okay, chemical debridement and hydration, usually using things like intracyte gel or duodenum gel. And that is what my initial treatment will be to try and get the chemical debridement going. If it's a low amount of absudate, so usually you add on a caltostat. Okay. Um, or you can use things like iodosorb powder because that is important. That is a useful adjunct because that can treat the underlying local infection. Or things like acticoat, the ironic silver will again help to reduce the bacterial burden in the wound. It depends if there is a, whether or not there is moderate to high exudate. <clears throat> so what I would do is do the first dressing and get the patient to come back. If I do, let's say, an EOD dressing, when the patient comes back, after two days, I open up the wound and I see that there's a lot of exudate. Then I know I shouldn't be using just the gel alone. I may have to use something else. And if there's a lot of exudate, I will generally use Aquacel with or without the silver or Mepilex with or without the silver to control the exudate. Because we obviously don't want too much exudate in that wound because then you can get maceration of the surrounding skin. So again, it depends on how the patient progresses. Sometimes a patient may present with an infected wound. So obviously you can see retinal cellulitis and this and it's quite a bad cellulitis. Um, they can even get ascending lymphangitis all the way up to the groin. So the important thing is once they have an infected ulcer like that is to treat the underlying infection and usually this means systemic antibiotics. <coughs> Cellulitis, crepitus, lymphangitis. Beware of sepsis because sometimes, especially in a diabetic patients, they can actually have uh, incipient sepsis and they may not have any fever. So in diabetic patients, I usually will make sure I cover for polymicrobial infection, especially anaerobes. And unfortunately, for a lot of these infected ulcers, usually you need some degree of surgical debridement on top of the systemic antibiotics to control the infection. So the good news is if we do it well, we will get to this stage where now there's actually quite a lot of healthy granulation. Again, 
granulation we still need to be careful of how we manage this because we want to speed up the recovery not delay the recovery so the important thing is to maintain a moist wound environment so we need to protect the wound the easiest way is to use transparent films stagger them upside just to cover the entire wound and let the granulation happen sometimes i use duodenum also because sometimes these ex granulating wounds can have a little bit of exudate so duodenum is just nice to just control the amount of exudate on the wound Take out the extra, but still maintain a moist wound environment. Now, sometimes patients may get hypergranulation. That means the granulation tissue actually grows uh, over and above the, the healthy tissue. And uh, one thing I like to use is actually use a silver base dressing. Because the silver base dressing actually does help to control the amount of granulating tissue. So things like Aquacel silver or Mepilex silver. And apply a little bit of pressure on the wound and that, do, that helps to control the hypergranulation. Now an exudative wound like you see in here, if you have put this patient on let's say a duodenum gel, and you open up and then there's fluid accumulating that hasn't been absorbed into the dressing means your dressing is not enough right to control the exudate so if you've been using let's say a duodenum gel and you still see a lot of exudate maybe the next dressing you want to consider is using something uh, with a higher exudative capacity like maybe a foam like change it to a mapilex so when you have excessive exudate you may need to have a secondary dressing so you may put your uh, initial dressing on top and put a secondary dressing on top of that to absorb all the extra fluid so things like a hydrofiber aqua cell or a foam like mapilex that will help to absorb all the excess exudate and then for these deep cavity wounds usually these are neuropathic the important thing is to remember the dressing product needs to go into the cavity there's no point just putting it on the outside because it doesn't uh, contact the 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 depths of the wound so you can't use things like foam or sheet dressings because that just covers the surface it doesn't go into the wound and usually we use a cavity dressing with a either we can use gels hydro uh, hydrogel like a uh, intracite or you use a foam that is a uh, shape for the cavity so they can go actually into the cavity uh, now, uh, another thing that is uh, quite commonly used today nowadays is negative pressure dressing where they apply a foam to the wound and this foam is then connected to a suction device and basically helps to uh, draw out all the excess fluid. So it's good for granulating wounds that have a high exudate content. But remember, it's not really suitable for patients who have uh, actively ischemic wound, necrotic wounds or stuffy wounds. The main reason is actually for these two is that because the foam once you apply we leave it for three to five days that means you don't see it for three to five days so if you have active infection the infection may actually be getting worse and you won't be seeing it so that's why i usually don't use this for patients who have actively infected wounds or sloughy wounds because this is the special foam that we apply it's uh, taped down and then this device is attached to the foam and it's attached to the machine which then suctions out all the excess exudate Okay, so we've come to the end of the, the talk. Now, let me just pull up the Q&A. Okay, I don't see any questions. Okay, well, if anybody has any questions, do feel free to write in into the Q&A. We'll keep the the presentation running for another 10-15 uh, minutes so if you have any questions do uh, drop in your Q&A I will be able to answer you directly in the Q&A box if not we will reply to you via your email that you have registered with us all right thank you and uh, have a nice day everyone
Okay, uh, I'm just uh, have looking at some of the questions that are coming through. Um, so I'll just uh, answer these uh, live. Looking at the some of the questions, um, clinical assessment of pedal pulses, I think the easiest is what we normally do, uh, examining the dorsalis pedis, feeling for the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial pulse. Like I said, normally if I can feel a palpable dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial, once it's palpable, you usually are looking at a pressure of about 80 to, well, about 60 to 80 mmHg pressure. And usually that is enough for uh, foot viability. Um, somebody asked about maggot therapy. Yes, uh, we do have some data on maggot therapy. And this is actually good for patients who have necrotic and stuffy wounds. But it requires, uh, number one is it requires a, uh, specially prepared maggots uh, that we, I, I think in Tantoxin use, we used to do, we used to get the maggots from uh, um, NTU. So there was a, a clinic that was preparing the maggots for us and we would put these into the wound. It does help in patients who have got very sluffy and necrotic wounds, but a lot of time it's patient acceptance. Uh, a lot of patients find it difficult to accept uh, this kind of treatment. <laughs> Okay, there was a question about when to refer a patient to hospital. I think in a patient who presents with arterial disease, obviously they need to be referred because they have what we call critical limb ischemia. Once you have ischemia with tissue loss, it's critical limb ischemia. And the key to treating critical limb ischemia, unfortunately, is revascularization. So somebody with a ulcer, absent pulses, you think it's an ischemic ulcer, then they need a referral um, pretty urgently to the hospital, get a vascular surgeon to assess because they need to have some degree of revascularization. Most of the ulcers actually can be treated mainly in an outpatient setting, like I said. It mainly is just a question of your uh, selection of wound products. The other group will be those patients who have very bad infection. So presence of lymphangitis especially, uh, cellulitis, bad cellulitis, and especially in diabetics, then those I would generally refer to the hospital because they may need intravenous antibiotic treatment at the minimum. Um, there's a question uh, there was whether or not place for use all in uh, dressings. Now, <clears throat> generally, I, would, I wouldn't I would use use all very much. I, I know it's a very good uh, antiseptic solution because it tends to uh, clear a lot of the bacterial load in the wound. The problem I find with U-Sol is unfortunately, it also affects the granulation. That means it not only <laughs> removes the bacteria, it also reduces the rate of the granulation tissue. So I generally don't usually use a lot of U-Sol if I'm worried about bacterial load in the wound. I would actually prefer to use a silver-based dressing or iodine-based dressing. At least that will help to control the local infection, but it will still promote uh, granulation. Um, there's a question about Deflon. Uh, how long to keep the patient on Deflon and for what dose? So generally for Deflon, uh, for varicose veins, I usually just give 500 milligrams BD. And I give it for about a re of reasonable duration of about two to four weeks. Again, it's important to know which group of patients will be benefiting from Deflon therapy. A lot of the patients who have symptoms, heaviness, okay, or tightness when they walk. So symptoms of venous hypertension, these patients usually will get a bit of relief. Usually about 50 to 70% of them will get some degree of relief from the symptoms, but the relief may not be complete, okay? Those who have very big distended varicose veins, venous ulcers, then usually those uh, Deflon doesn't help as much, okay? So symptomatic patients, yes, but those who have overt signs, Usually, Deflon doesn't really help them that much. Um, another question from another doctor about infected wounds, whether or not hydrogen peroxide help. Okay. <laughs> Again, I think it's a matter of personal preference. Um, yes, the hydrogen peroxide does help because it helps to remove especially a lot of the uh, bacteria from the wound because of the effervescent effect of the hydrogen peroxide. But again, like I said, a lot of these uh, dress, uh, sorry, these uh, solutions that we use in the wound uh, may be a bit uh, 
I wouldn't say caustic, but it it um it actually reduces the granulation potential for the wound. So a lot of times, after you use the peroxide, it looks very clean. But the next few days, you actually don't see a lot of granulation happening. So it is a good fix at that time, but it affects the future wound healing further on. So again, if I'm worried about uh, wound infection in a, in a dirty, sloughy wound, usually I will use things like a gel, like a duodenum gel or intracyte gel. It takes a little bit longer. It may take one or two weeks for it to work to de-slough all the, the muck from <laughs> inside the wound. But at least uh, that actually, actually promotes the granulation thereafter. Okay, so I think I've addressed. Uh... Oh, okay. All right. Sorry, there are a couple of more questions. Um, somebody asked about a solution. What solution is best for wound cleaning and irrigation? Okay, so generally for wound cleaning and irrigation, I would just use a dilute solution of chlorhexidine. So, um, an aqueous chlorhexidine. <laughs> Don't use the alcohol-based chlorhexidine. Uh, aqueous chlorhexidine, and usually, I think if I'm not wrong, it's a 0.1%, and usually that is innocuous, but it's good enough to remove most of the bacterial burden from the wound. Uh, if you have a very sloughy wound, a very dirty wound, no matter what you use, it's not going to flush everything out. And usually for those, then we use the adjuncts, so gels to de slough and uh, silver or iodine to treat the local infection. Okay, compression stockings. So again, compression stockings for patients with varicose veins. Um, usually we decide whether or not to give them knee length or thigh length, depending on where is the reflux. So if they actually have reflux in the thigh veins that we can see on the ultrasound, they will need a thigh length uh, compression stocking. All right, if not, then a knee length should be fine. In terms of the type of compression stocking, basically we divide into four classes. Uh, class one to class class one to class four, depending on how much compression. So class one is the lightest compression, about twenty to thirty mmHg at the ankle. Class four is the highest, and I rarely see patients who can tolerate class four because the it's just very very tight. So I would normally start patients if they want to try a pair of compression stocking for varicose veins. I usually start them on class one. And after six months, if they tolerate well, I will usually move them up to class two, but usually class two is enough for most patients with varicose veins. Um, they can buy compression stockings, but usually compression stockings are only available in the hospital, in the hospital pharmacies. Um, all the restructured hospitals should have. I think the Parkway Hospitals, uh, Mount Elizabeth uh, Orchard and Mount Elizabeth Novena, they do have available. Um, I'm not sure about the other restructured hospitals. Yeah, They can try the Guardian Pharmacies, uh, Unity Pharmacies, but usually those in the shopping malls, they usually don't carry compression stockings per se. Usually it's more in the hospital uh, pharmacies. All right, so I think I've uh, addressed most of the questions that have been asked. Um, okay, another question. Can a patient buy compression stockings in the hospital without a prescription? Yes, this is available over the counter. <clears throat> in most of the restructured hospitals, you just approach the pharmacy assistants. Um, and what they will need to do is actually they need to make make some measurements. So they need to measure your calf circumference just below the knee, your ankle circumference and the length of the lower leg. So it's not just go and pick up off the shelf. Somebody needs to help you in terms of measuring to make sure that you get the correct size. There's a question on using Daflon for spider and reticular veins. Uh, 
Um, if the spider veins and reticular veins are symptomatic, if it's causing tightness, is it causing heaviness, and usually it's not the, the reticular or spider veins itself, it's usually the underlying uh, varicose condition that is causing the symptoms. So yes, Deflon can help. But Deflon doesn't uh, improve the appearance. That means if you take Deflon, it doesn't mean that the spider veins will get less and the reticular veins will get less. Unfortunately, no. Um, it will just help with some of the underlying symptoms of the underlying uh, venous hypertension, but not so much so the appearance of the spider and reticular veins. Okay, I think we've come to the end of our uh, webinar uh, for today. We will be uh, putting up a recording of this in our website. Uh, give us a few days to just uh, tidy everything up. And if anybody wants to uh, access this uh, webinar presentation, it will be available on our website, uh, nexusurgical.sg in a couple of days time so that uh, you can share this with your colleagues if they want to uh, watch this webinar presentation. Oh, one last question. Uh, somebody asked about varicose veins in the foot near the toes. <laughs> Unfortunately for that, it's going to be a bit difficult because a lot of times the skin, especially on the dorsum of the foot, is actually very thin. So any surgical intervention in that area, unfortunately, is going to be very difficult because the thin skin actually will break down quite a fair bit, especially if you, you know, do surgery to remove the varicose veins. So generally for varicose veins, from the ankle down to the foot, we generally leave them alone. But if they have big varicose veins there, usually what we need to check is the long saphenous vein above in the calf and in the thigh, whether or not that is incompetent. Usually if we treat that bit, the varicose veins distally in the lower leg and in the foot actually will improve over time. All right, so thank you everybody for attending. So I hope to see everybody back uh, in two weeks in a fortnight's time, our next talk uh, in uh, two weeks time. Uh, this will be by Dr. Chong Mei Sien, who is a geriatrician, and uh, she'll be talking to us about a geriatric topic on that time. Um, so I hope to see everybody back in two weeks time. All right. Okay, have a good day. Thank you very much, everybody.